1989's Fax Xanadu by Hudson Soft, aka Fuzz Xanadu, is the type of game that's familiar and likely fondly remembered by those of us who grew up reading Nintendo Power. Developed by Hudson, it was published by the Big End themselves, and as such, received a fair amount of press and hype. It got its own dedicated episode of Captain N, the Game Master, and an eventual release on the Wii's Virtual Console worldwide. It's a certified cult classic, but it has every right to be a primo-grade, top-shelf, A-number-one, uh, classic classic. Though its blend of open-world, action platforming, and RPG elements put it in great company, like one NES game in particular, it's a game that really has its own thing going for it. The box promises daggers, wing boots, mantras, and monsters, and it definitely delivers, but deeper look reveals that Faxanadu's triumphs are much more. The game starts with you, known only as the hero, returning home from a previous journey, and it turns out shit is fucked in your once prosperous town. In an unusual and somewhat ballsy move, the game allows you to see just how bad things are. Everything is brown, everyone looks sad and tired, especially the king, and there's even monsters walking within the castle walls. You'll see that the localization ain't bulletproof, thanks for the golds, highness, and Nintendo didn't remove this guy's cigarette, but this level of introduction is typically reserved for the title screen demo or the instruction book. Faxanadu shows confidence in its ability to build a tangible world, and takes its time at the beginning. We later learned that there was once peace between the elves, your people who live at the base of the great world tree, and the dwarves who live in the city above the tree. Since you've been gone, a mysterious meteorite has polluted the air, dried up the water, and poisoned the minds of the dwarves who have become crazed and mutated. Though much of this is told to you by the struggling elven townsfolk, which features one of my personal favorite pieces of NES dialogue, the meteorite is meditated on at the Tower of Suffer, Faxanadu employs the reliable storytelling adage of show don't tell through its ambitious dark fantasy aesthetic. Faxanadu flat out features some of the system's most interesting visuals. Lacking the ability to use a subtle dark color palette on the NES, I mean, just look at how many different colors of blue were available versus browns and grays, and perhaps also the cultural incentive, believe it or not there was a time before Dark Souls and the gritty superhero reboot, most fantasy games on the NES use bright colors and delegate the music to create the appropriate vibe, however in contrast it is to the visuals. Hudson was having none of that, and the world of Faxanadu is grimy, dusty, dirty, Faded blue skies hang above massive, contorted brown roots. Dungeons are the color of my grandma's basement, and towns are always shrouded in a grayish black fog. It's a risky stylistic direction, one that could have just as easily ruined the game, but it makes the world feel lived in, with a grit that makes the plight of your people feel real. Their tired, listless expressions are at first kind of goofy, but it works in portraying exhausted, depressed people stuck in a shitty situation. Ain't no one having a good time in the world of Fax Xanadu, though the way they constantly blink is pretty funny. And I guess this guy gets his keys from Flavor Country. The enemies also aren't your usual beady-eyed, snarling beasts. They're gnarled, twisted, or just odd-looking creatures. Your typical knights and skeletons are not to be found here. Instead, monsters look like something from the mind of H.R. Geiger. Though Hudson still found a way to get their big bumblebee in there. NES games that attempt this tend to just look bland, coming across as more incompetently rendered than anything else. Faxanadu isn't even a horror game, but it gives most NES games that fancy themselves as horror a run for their money in creature and environment design. Crowning achievement of Faxanadu's dark fantasy aesthetic is the second area of the game, the Land of Mist. Here, Hudson's unique vision comes together remarkably well and presents one of the most unwelcoming areas in NES history. In place of blue skies is a cold, empty black obscured by shifting gray and purple haze. Ropes are purple as if weathered and rotting from exposure. Platforms are crumbled and stained with a black maroon or pale white and the music is almost without low-end bass and completely without percussion, just an off-kilter symphony of shrill, high-pitched notes. You even enter this area facing left, after the area before had you moving right. It uses every possible trick to push this game's already established grimy aesthetic to something truly unsettling, producing one of the most finely rendered areas in an NES game. In its time, how many games attempted this? 
hell, how many games attempt this now? The distinction to remember here is again, Faxanadu is not a horror game. True, some games try to elicit a deeper emotional response from the player, and most go for tension or scares, like Jason hiding in the cabin, evacuating a doomed air fortress, terrible nights to have a curse. But liberal use of bright colors can work against this. Hey, this is supposed to be Dracula's castle, right? Why are the floors lined with bright orange blocks? I know this is rhetorical, but it's because perhaps due to a willingness to play it safe or time constraints, they prioritized readability with a high contrast background that still works from a gameplay perspective, though fails to ground the game in a reality. Faxanadu manages to split the difference between readability and its dark fantasy aesthetic, and it's never more successful than with the Land of Mist. It's inhospitable, it's unsettling. The thick haze, the colors, the music. Everything is wrong, but somehow it comes together. An incredible achievement. And it's not just the game's artistic peak, it's also unfortunately the highlight of your adventure. The first area is rather straightforward and doesn't overwhelm the player with choices right out of the gate. But things really get going in the Land of Mist. Of the four areas, you spend the most time here since it's the most open area in the game with the most dungeons and forks. There's a lot to explore and it'll take you some time and more than a few deaths to see it all. The following two worlds, though they have incredible music, are ultimately just too short. The third area, the World Tree, is at first a relief. Oh god, sunlight, blue skies! But it's a very similar look to the first area, and while this area has its share of locked doors, none actually lead to dungeons, just a couple of screens and a boss guarding items you can't equip yet. Before you know it, you're at the final area, which is basically just a hub for the final two dungeons and the very easy final boss. You get the sense that the team had grander expectations for the back half of this game, but they just ran out of either steam or time. The game doesn't go off the rails or anything, but there's a noticeable contrast between Faxanadu's two halves, ending on a whimper instead of a bang. This doesn't bring the game down that much. Faxanadu still has a lot going for it in terms of style, and the good news keeps coming because it's got solid gameplay to match. But something occurred to me when I was playing through this game again. This already fine game is suddenly more impressive when you realize it is a contemporary and better executed version of Simon's Quest. And this distinction isn't immediately recognizable because Fax Andrew does it so much better. Listen, we all know Castlevania 2 is a flawed game, but it's still regarded as an NES classic mainly for its innovation and in that soundtrack. This isn't yet another YouTube video shitting on Simon's Quest. I bring this up to show that if you've never played Faxanadu, but you're familiar with Simon's Quest, well then you already know what is about. Both Simon's Quest and Faxanadu are two-dimensional, side-scrolling action platformers with unbroken open worlds. Both feature light RPG mechanics with experience systems and attempt a dark fantasy aesthetic. This might not sound special, but when compared to the NES library at large, this places the games in a league all their own. Zelda 2 was also side-scrolling with an experience system, but has a large hub world, as did Battle of Olympus and Clash of Demon Head. Konami's own Goonies 2 and Radical Rescue, as well as Blaster Master and of course Metroid, have large unbroken worlds, but are strictly action games where items and upgrades are procured instead of purchased from merchants. Super Adventure Island 2 was more directly inspired by Metroid. Wonder Boy in Monster World certainly fits the mold, though it's a far jauntier ordeal, and Crystalis's bird-eye view perspective nearly removes platforming from the equation, though it does feature its own land of mist. The more you think about it, the more it becomes clear that Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, and Faxanadu are two peas in a pod. As you've seen, Faxanadu has swords instead of whips, though they both attack with a few frames of wind-up, something seldom seen on the system. Movement overall for both is kinda stiff actually, and that knockback can be a real pain. Neither hero is equipped to handle an enemy bum-rushing them. Both games have their share of platforming, and both can prove very frustrating, but Faxanadu smartly avoids instant death pits and spikes. A botched jump never results in instant death in Faxanadu. Pardon the pun, but the stakes are higher in Simon's Quest's platforming. Faxanadu also has an unorthodox leveling system, rewarding increased money and experience baseline upon game over instead of boosting your stats. There's no three lives like in Simon's Quest, but it's not back down to zero at continue or passwords. In fact, it's possible to have more money upon resurrection. Just be sure you get your title slash level up from the church gurus before trying to collect your funeral money. You could play Simon's Quest for hours and probably not realize there was a leveling system. 
technically, Simon's Quest world might be bigger, but Faxanadu has what the other sorely lacks, a sense of pacing. Simon's Quest's world definitely seems big, though it's more just sprawling. Navigating it is a pain due to multiple repeated screens and some of the most obtuse puzzles in video game history. Can they even be called puzzles? Faxanadu not only separates its world into four digestible areas that, for the record, can be backtracked to, its opening hour is very straightforward. Castle, town, dungeon, town are basically a straight line, and then the game goes, hey, you gotta find like three wells or something, uh, good luck kid. Simon's quest just sort of kicks you out the front seat and screens, figure it out, as it peels off. You'll never be completely lost, though both games have spotty translations, you can depend on townsfolks to fill you in on your next task. For example, as a kid I was able to eventually find the Joker key on my own, but never knew I had to kneel at the goddamn lake. I don't mean to paint Faxandu as an easy game, though. After its brief introduction, it earns its open-world stripes with the dreaded go-nowhere dungeons with waste of time dead ends, item fetch quests, and a dash of backtracking. Unfortunately, both games end on a whimper with short final dungeons and easy final bosses. <laughs> hey, another thing they have in common. The day-night cycle, multiple endings, deceptive NPCs, and a truly legendary soundtrack are about all that Simon's Quest has over Faxanadu. But those first two things aren't really implemented very well, the lying NPCs just end up hurting the game, and Faxanadu's soundtrack ain't no slouch. If you want to praise Simon's Quest for being innovative, then praise Faxanadu for being smarter. Because pound for pound, it's the better game. Alright, and now it is time for the elephant in the room, and that is the name of the game itself, Faxanadu. While there is no way some American kid in the 80s and 90s would ever know this, the correct pronunciation is in fact Fa Xanadu, it being a portmanteau of Famicom and Xanadu. But before we dive too deep into that, I submit to the jury the following clips from Captain N, the Game Master. And so Game Boy and Duke set out on their dangerous quest through Faxanadu. We'll never have any peace until we drive them off Faxanadu once and for all. Meanwhile, on the elfin world of Faxanadu... Faxanadu calling the Palace of Power! I am King Melfus of Faxanadu! I rest my case. Because if it's good enough for Captain N, it's good enough for Captain D. It's me, I'm, Cap I'm Captain D. The introduction and ending allude to the hero having other journeys. This is because Faxanadu is a spin-off of Xanadu, sequel turned spin-off series of the Dragon Slayer games. It's no accident that the strongest sword in the game is the Dragon Slayer. Faxanadu is actually part of an incredibly massive line of RPGs. The Japanese pronunciation was lost on North American kids because the Xanadu and Dragon Slayer games have mostly existed in Japan. However, maybe you've heard of Legacy of the Wizard, aka Dragon Slayer 4. That's right, these two games are actually cousins. In this insanely long line of games, only four so far have made it to North America. Faxanadu, Legacy of the Wizard, Dragon Slayer The Legend of Heroes for the Super CD Turbo Graphics, and The Legend of Heroes A Tier for Vermilion for the PSP. Faxanadu has the unique distinction of being the sole title in this lineage not developed by Falcom, who are also responsible for the East games, which also include a head-spinning number of entries. Though the title screen states under license from Falcom, Faxanadu is 100% a Hudson Soft joint. It was typical in this time for game credits to be filled with pseudonyms and odd initials instead of actual names. Faxanadu, on the other hand, does not feature credits at all, and it would appear that it's still unknown who exactly made this game. The one credit that seems to be confirmed is Dame Bomberman herself, Jun Chikuma, who took a break composing the music for all of the Bomberman games, Military Madness, and the Wonder Boy games to pen Faxanadu's wonderful soundtrack. Faxanadu is not a particularly rare game. It should be hard to track down, and it shouldn't set you back much. But if you want to play it right now, it's available on the Wii Virtual Console if you still got one of those things lying around. Uh, but you can also get Castlevania II Simon's Quest if you want. I mean, if you want to. Hey, thanks for watching. Big shout out to all of my Patreon backers. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, Feel free to get us on the Patreon or just hit that like, comment, subscribe buttons. There's also social media down there. There's more videos over here. And uh, thanks again for watching.
Oh, this video ended on a whimper, too, didn't it? Um, Derek, it's harder than it looks.